Rumor has it that my guest, out of all the employees at PJ Tour Live, has the best sand save percentage. He has told me that, or at least that's what his game is showing. He joins me on the Honest Hunting Podcast. John Swansek is with me, host of PJ Tour Live, also talk of the tour podcast, which is awesome content that he puts out. Just had one that recapped the Genesis Invitational, host of Champions Tour events on Golf Channel, coordinated producer and talent at PGA Tour, a long-suffering Mets fan. I'm Brian Fenley here, the golf broadcaster, but with also Tennis Channel and Fox Sports Radio. John, I'm excited to tell your story in a way that, yes, we'll talk golf, but we're going to learn about you as a father. We're going to learn about you as a sports fan in general and stuff about you that might not be on your LinkedIn profile. So looking forward to the conversation. Brian, uh, good to be with you. I can't confirm my say and save percentage, but I can tell you that I played around golf yesterday with my two boys, Nick and Jack. They're 21 and 24. I managed to shoot 88 by hitting zero greens in regulation. Oh, for 18. Uh, but the old man can get it around when I'm near the green. So that's how I'm able to score these days because I can't hit it anywhere, of course. Well, I now makes me think you telling that story of that video of Sergio Garcia when he was climbing a tree and he was trying to hit a ball from like one of the high hanging limbs. And I'm thinking to myself, John, how many times have you been in that situation yourself? <laughs> you know, I was on the call for that. Now that you mentioned yeah. that, that, that was, um, it would have been the Arnold Palmer Invitational, uh, which is coming up next week, the second stop of the Florida Swing. And that was a, a long time ago. But I remember being on the call uh, with Billy Kratzer, one of our great analysts who's a four-time champion. And that's got him well over a million clicks on uh, on YouTube since then. So, yeah, a, a weird part of, uh, of infamy for Sergio Garcia for PJ Tour Live. What were you thinking when he decided to climb up with a tree like that for something and someone that maybe you've never seen do that before? I was thinking there was a good chance it was going to end badly on a number of different fronts. And, uh, you know, because those were the days where some guys were still wearing metal spikes. Remember, those are the nails that are about a half inch to the bottom at the bottom of the shoe um but Sergio was uh was pretty pretty deft and pretty majestic with the dismount as I recall yeah he he definitely made it look as easy as it could be in a situation like that you being a Mets fan a long-suffering Mets fan we'll talk more about golf in a moment but Explain the torture slash joy of being a Mets fan and being so devoted to supporting that team. I don't know if we have enough time. You know, <laughs> and I probably should be laying down for this part of the conversation, Brian. That would it would soothe soothe my mind a little bit. Um, I'm encouraged by what's happening with the organization. We had some very lean years when the Wilpons owned the team, and they were known as the coupons, honestly, by a lot of Mets fans, <laughs> uh, because they did not behave like a professional sure. sports organization in the number one market in the country. But uh, Steve Cohen has opened the checkbook, and this team is built to win right now. We're not young. We've got a lot of veterans, especially in the front end of the rotation, uh, with Verlander and Scherzer as well. So preserving those guys over the course of a long season is going to be paramount to our our playoff chances, but I think the expectations are really high. Um, and that's a good problem to have as a sports fan. It's uh, It's been a while, really. We, we slipped into the playoffs last year, didn't go so well against uh, the Padres when we needed our big guys to step up and they didn't, but I'm really hopeful and optimistic with where the Mets are headed this season. So the expectations are high for the Mets. What about for you, John, what are the expectations that you hold for yourself in what you do? You know, um, I started this this journey in 1996, January of 96. Um, I worked in local news up in Albany, New York, not far from where I grew up in Saratoga Springs. And my wife, Holly, and I were tired of the upstate New York winters. And we just sort of cast a wide net and landed down here in Florida. And we said to ourselves, you know, let's give it five years and then see where we're at. Of course, in the summer of 96, Tiger Woods makes his debut at the Greater Milwaukee Open, wins the Masters by 12 the following spring, Brian, and it has just exploded ever since. The opportunity, the content that uh, the PJ Tour is responsible for and pushes out week after week. And I've been very fortunate to sort of 
be along for this this wild ride and and really it has been the era of tiger you know that's my career has luckily sort of aligned with and i hope it it continues for years to come i'll i'll be here until they kick me out put it that way John Swansek is with me. I'm Brian Fenley. He's not going to be kicked out of this interview anytime soon. Loving this conversation with him. So you get to Florida after starting out in New York. And at one point, when you get to Florida, you become a father. And you've got a couple of kids. Where do they teach you in life? Where do they step in and clue you in on things that that maybe they think they do things better than you at or where they're having fun in, in ribbing you a little bit well 24 7 tech support when i can't figure out stuff on my phone and on my <laughs> mac first of all <laughs> that's where they offer the greatest value these days um you know you, you like to think of your kids as as the best version of of who you are and and who my wife holly is and i think they are I'm biased, of course. I think they're exceedingly um, strong-willed, smart, independent, intuitive, funny, loyal kids, um, all of them. And yeah, they they give me the stick all the time. Uh, I'm known more as Johnny around the house than dad, quite honestly. But I, you know, that's cool. I'll I'll put up with that. And you know, it's a it's a bouncing act when your kids become. Adults, you know, 21, 24, and 28 are the ages of my kids. You still want to be involved, but you want to act like you're not really that involved and not really that <laughs> interested. You know what I mean? And it's it's something that I've had to learn uh, in, in recent years. Um, but we love each other a ton, and there's a deep mutual respect uh, between all of us. And, I, you know, that's what it's all about. I couldn't ask for anything more. Well, yeah, what goes into being a cool dad in their eyes? <laughs> Don't ask me, man. <laughs> Don't ask me. Uh, who knows? We have a lot of the same common interests. Um, not, the boys are big sports fans. In fact, they've been saddled with all the uh, the same teams that I have been devoted to through the years. The Mets, the Knicks, the Miami Dolphins, uh, USC, and football out where you are. In fact, I've been a fan since I was a, a kid growing up in New York. Um, and our daughter, Sam, uh, not as much of a, of a sports fan, but... Uh, surprisingly, every once in a while, she will key into something that I would not have uh, expected. So they're very in tune with what I do, and I try to give them the same amount of attention and respect uh, to what they do. So um, it's symbiotic for the most part, yeah. How has your wife been your greatest fan through this journey? And you taking a chance at taking a risk and coming down to Florida, seeing how the PJ Tour has shown their faith in you, but along this journey, along this ride in Florida, and as your roles have evolved and changed and grown with the PGA Tour, the way in which your wife has been there for you in a priceless way, where do you find that that's happened? You know, in big ways and in little ways. Um, Holly and I have been together for 32 years now, and she has been so supportive i can't even begin to describe it the sacrifices that she's made uh, that has sort of allowed me to be kind of front and center and doing so while pursuing her own career interests uh, as a journalist back in the day and as a communications professional all while raising our children honestly and doing the bulk of uh, the work in the home the most important work between the four walls of your house, working from home with <laughs> babies in the house and uh, always, you know, being a monumental contributor to what we're trying to accomplish within our, our family structure. So I would be nowhere or nothing uh, without Holly. And uh, that's exactly what she told me to say today, by the way. Did she really? She had you all pre-programmed to say that. No, that comes from the heart. That sounds like yeah. something that wasn't scripted, John, that, that you're speaking from the heart in a candid conversation. And that's all I could ever hope for here. John Swantek is with me. I'm Brian Fenley. I saw that it was just a few, a few years ago when you attended your first Grateful Dead concert. What was that experience like all those years ago for you? Um, that would have been in my hometown of Saratoga Springs at the Saratoga Performing Arts Center. Um, and I probably saw the dead 
20 times or so oh, after wow. that. And the the era would have been early 80s, maybe 82 to 90, like through high school and college and, and those years. And, you know, I've just always been a massive fan, not only of their music, especially on a live improvisational level. Um, you, you can't really describe it to anyone unless they've seen them in person. Uh, anyone who's familiar with their studio work might be unimpressed, but that's not who they were. That was not really their identity. They were a, a touring band. And to do it for 50 years is extraordinary. I mean, how many bands just implode over the course of, you know, 10, 15 years if they're lucky enough to be um, together for that long. And now there's a new iteration called Dead and Company, the surviving members of the dead with John Mayer. And they've been touring since 2016. I've seen them a couple of times as well. Wow. So I hope the legacy continues in whatever iteration it continues in, because it is truly a special and unique live concert experience, unlike any other I've ever been to. Well, and like you said, they're great at improvising. What about you as an improviser when it comes to golf broadcast? Because there's so much that you can prepare for, but here you are, you're having to react in real time. Where do you find your greatest strengths in improvising come out during a telecast? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I do prepare heavily, but it's it's interesting. Sometimes by the end of a broadcast week, I'll look down at my notes and I may have gotten to maybe 10, 15% of it. And you've probably experienced the same sure. thing, right, Brian, in your play-by-play -play work. But you can't not be yeah. in a position to rely on the homework that you've done. It's, uh, it's a, a crutch, I suppose. It's there if you need it. But in a live environment, the personality, the ebb and flow of the broadcast changes so much depending on so many factors, on the level of competition, on the, the weather in our case, because it's an, an outdoor sport, on the, the tone and the tenor and the, the quality of the play and all of it. Um, you know, it's a little bit of a of a balancing act. You've got to kind of be on your toes. You've got to recognize, okay, when do I need to be serious when is there uh, gravitas that's required when does it need to be a little light and goofy when does it need to be content driven and informational it's a it's a changing landscape sort of minute by minute and that's really what makes it fun no tournament is the same from week to week um, no player is the same to cover from day to day and it can change from hour to hour with the the analysts that you're alongside and the on-course walkers that are describing the action from the course. Well, and with those analysts and what you talk about what's fun, what has to be fun is working with different analysts and adapting to their personalities, depending upon who you're working with. Everybody's got a neat and unique personality and an insight that's just a little bit different than the other person that you're working with. So how do you bridge that chemistry with whoever you work with to create that level of comfort and ease and flow that comes across during the broadcasts? You know, they're all very different, as you as you point out, and I think they're the key component to any broadcast. That's the analyst, and that's whoever is on the ground for you. Um, the host, I think, is kind of a traffic cop, you know, to make sure everything gets from point A to point B. But I really try and make an effort to engage the analyst and make um, he or she the star of the show. And I've worked with a lot of uh, men and women who are accomplished champions in the game. I learn a lot from them as well over the course of uh, our time together. And, you know, they're all different. Some of them need a little more nudging and prompting, especially if they're new to it. And we're, we frankly get a lot of players who are not far removed from their sure. playing days and trying to break into the broadcasting space. So it's sort of a way to kind of get your chops into it. Um, so they need a little more guidance and, and that's fine, but then you you create a flow and you can sense it pretty quickly if someone's got it or they really need to be kind of carried along over the course of uh, of the show. So they're all different. It's part of what makes it unique and, and challenging for a host in my seat as well. John Swantek is with me. I'm Brian Fenley. Of course, you can hear him on PJ Tour Live, all the great work he's doing there. Talk of the Tour podcast on Golf Channel. 
host of many different Champions Tour events. How do you critique yourself post-tournament, post-event, in the way in which you are looking at yourself and saying, I like what I did there? Good question. It's an important part of the process, isn't it? I mean, I'm sure you've done the same thing. I'll go back and watch and and listen. And, um, you know, I think one of the unique aspects of doing PJ Tour Live is that we are on the air for a long time. <laughs> we'll come on the air seven in the morning and we'll go past six, 630 at night. So over the course of 12 hours, and I'll get a few breaks in there. So there's a lot of overlap you see a lot of the same thing um you've got to sort of manufacture a narrative sometimes when it doesn't sort of organically exist um and a way for me to improve that i've tried to push myself in this space brian is to is to say things differently say the yeah. same thing but yeah. but say it differently um and that's a challenge. Um, you know, it's it's hard to get to that space because there are there are lulls during the course of a, a of a long day like that. But presenting things that look the same in a different way is uh, is one of the big challenges that I that I try and sort of push myself toward. And there's a lot that's presented about you on Google when it comes to your knowledge and your experience in golf. But what can't I look up about you? that would really understand and take you to a deep level and really getting to know your breadth of knowledge of the game that, that say Google doesn't do justice. Hmm. You remember when Herschel Walker was traded? Uh, back yes. In the day? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, I've heard you this story. See. I've heard this story. Tell me. Uh, so I was working at, WQBK radio in Albany, New York. It was my first job. I was right out of uh, Cortland State in New York where I went to school. And there was a sort of a dean of local sportscasters. John Graney was his name. And he was the one who hired me. And one day I'm on the air doing like a 7 a.m. sports report in the morning. And I get a call from someone telling me Herschel Walker is about to be traded. Um, Vikings and Cowboys were the two teams involved in the trade. And these are the players that are involved. These are the draft picks that are involved. I'm a personal source of John Graney. You can go with it. And this was so exciting to me. I mean, I was 23 years old. I was about to break, you know, the biggest NFL trade of the season. So I called my man, John, who was the primary source behind all of this and relayed the story. And he said, absolutely, it's legit. It's valid. You could go with it. And it's funny. So I reported it. And then the trade was not consummated for a few days. I don't know if there were medicals that were holding it up or whatever. So I looked to be sort of reckless and irresponsible and foolish. And I felt my career in its very early stages just crumbling <laughs> to the ground. Uh, but eventually the trade went down uh, a few days later. And uh, it was a nice feather in the, in the cap of a 23-year-old kid. What kind of credit did you get afterwards from people that came to you and said, how did you do that? Or great work on you. What sort of reception did you get? once the deal was consummated well there was a lot less 24 7 coverage in in those days and that's the kind of thing sure. that probably would have blown up on social these days right sure. but back then a little local tv coverage and maybe the media column in the local newspaper that sort of thing but not not much beyond that it's just business as usual as we wrap up this conversation john what is the most adventurous round of golf that you've ever played Ad adventurous it is a very vague term to describe maybe an exotic place you have played from a course perspective or from a round that found yourself in more greenside bunkers than you would have hoped for, where it's a round unlike any other that you've ever played before. I can share with you a surreal moment I had on a a golf trip with a friend of mine, good friend who had turned 50. This was in 2017. There were eight of us that went to Scotland and we had an entire week lined up five different courses, including the old course at St. Andrews, wow. which is hallowed sacred ground. And we're on the first tee and I'm the second player to hit after, you know, with eight of us there, two foursomes back to back. 
And the first guy that hits, my good friend, the birthday boy, and he tops one off the first tee. That was that was not <laughs> the visual I was looking for because I already couldn't feel my hands. Uh, I had no spit in my throat and uh, my heart was pounding out of my chest. So I get up there and I swear to you, the only thought was don't whiff. That's how terrified I was standing on the first seat. Just make contact with the club head to the ball and move it generally in that direction. I would have been satisfied with that. So I step up there and I hit a cut shot. That's kind of my go-to shot, a little left to right old man bullet peeler. That's what I go to. And I hit this high, towering, majestic draw, which I have never hit in my life, Brian. Where it came from, I don't know. But it came on the first tee on the old course at St. Andrews. And I went on to shoot 88 that day, which was a really good score. And it was a moment that I will never forget. It's it's come, It's come. flooding back to me now as I tell you this story. So I'm glad you brought it up. It was pretty cool. How did those, how did those nerves subside once you you hit off the first immediately or did they <laughs> no, immediately and then a few ales during the course of the round always helps i recommend that highly <laughs> <laughs> well he comes highly recommended himself in the golf media space in john swantek with pj tour live golf channel talk of the tour podcast and of course coordinating producer talent of pj tour john this was so fun diving into your career and i'm sure we went places that Maybe you didn't expect, but it gave us a window into your personality. And I thought in a really unique way, I'm Brian Fedley, man. Thanks so much for, for being a part of this. Brian, uh, thank you. I appreciate it. Enjoyed the conversation and uh, talk to you down the road.